Carl Sagan is possibly the best-known scientist in the world. He has performed groundbreaking work about the nature of other planets. He's won a Pulitzer Prize for his book about the origins of human intelligence. His books and TV series have educated millions and millions of people about the universe. Carl Sagan's latest book is called Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space. He joins me now in our studio to talk about humanity's place in the universe. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I feel very small <laughs> when I read well, your book. I feel tiny. Well, you are, and so am I, and uh, so are the rest of us. I mean, uh, uh, being big isn't the only uh, the only thing. We we are well. We we live on a very insignificant world among many, which circles a humdrum star, the sun which is one of 400 billion others that make up the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of 100 billion other galaxies that makes up the universe, which it is now beginning to look is one of uh, an enormous number, perhaps an infinite number of other closed-off universes. In that context, of course we're tiny. Do, you, do, you, do those numbers still have meaning for you? Do you oh, actually sure. know what 100 billion Well, means? I can't picture it in my head, but I have difficulty picturing in my head six. I mean, six objects all at once, close your eyes, see if you can see them all without sort of moving your, your mental eyes from one to another. But uh, what does it mean to, to know what 100 billion is? Uh, just to be able to calculate it, to know how it's bigger than something and smaller than something. And um, Scientists do that all the time. So do uh, economists. So do people in balancing their pocketbook budgets. I, I don't think it's all that hard. Your book is a dramatic reminder of how tr of how human travel has accelerated in the last few decades, but you start with your family's own progress. Tell me a bit about your grandfather ferrying people across the, the, the river in Central Europe. My uh, mother's father, Leib Gruber, uh, grew up in a very poor family in uh, what was then the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the only job he could get was uh, being a beast of burden. He uh, he would uh, have people climb on his shoulders, one one at a time, uh, and he would wade across the river uh, uh, in a shallow part and deposit them on the opposite bank, and that was his his occupation. Did he did he live long enough to understand the worlds that you were exploring in your work? No, he did not quite live to Sputnik, but there was one. Uh, one moment when I was age 13 and uh, he asked me uh, what it is I wanted to do when I grew up and I said an astronomer and uh, he didn't know what that meant. It had to be explained to him and after he understood he said yes, yes, very impatiently, but how will you make a living? Um, <laughs> and uh, that was in fact a very deep question. I had never thought about it as uh, a way to make a living. I just thought of it as a way to to fulfill a uh, a joy and I thought I'd have to have some quite other and very boring job in order to support myself and do astronomy weekends and uh, evenings. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life when my high school biology teacher told me there were people who were actually paid to do astronomy. If you could get him on the phone now and, and talk about, I mean, he lived through the age when we've gone from one satellite to exploration of the solar system, and, and, and he just had a moment or two to give him the news. What would it be? The most I guess I would say, uh, Grandpa, we've uh, we've explored almost all the large worlds in the solar system, and we've sent four ships to the stars. And he would look at me uncomprehendingly and uh, argue, "But what's it good for?" I think that would be the quality of the of the discussion with Now, you have reservations yourself about what it's good for. It's, it's into, you're, you're, you're such a fair scholar that when later in the book you're examining the arguments for carrying on with this, you begin by, prevent, by presenting very convincing <laughs> arguments for not carrying on with it. Well, I, I, it's true. I, I do, in the book, seem to be arguing with myself, um, and that's because I, I am arguing with myself. There are, there are arguments on both sides, and particularly... Many of the arguments that we've heard about uh, human spaceflight uh, are, are tendentious to, to spurious. I mean, we don't need it for science. Robots are much better and much cheaper and don't risk human lives. And the spin-off arguments uh, don't work, uh, sort of like uh, 
give me $80 billion to send people to the moon and I'll throw in a free stickless frying pan. But we would have got it anyway, you say. The Teflon didn't come from... Oh, oh it, it, the, the argument is specious on several different grounds. Yeah. But uh, th that's just one of them. You know, if we're That was a little prop I thought it had, and you kicked it out. No, no Velcro, no, no, no Teflon. No, no, those, those arguments don't work. The, uh, you see, the robotic programs have uh, revolutionized our world in... in communications, in uh, military reconnaissance, treaty verification, meteorology, monitoring the health of the Earth, um, examining other planets and comparing them with ourselves, looking into the deepest questions of the origin and fate of the universe. All of that is done with robots comparatively cheaply. That is cost effective. What's not cost effective is the human program. Its the original justification was in the context of the Cold War, beat the Russians, show our rockets are bigger mm. and better than their rockets, and so on. That obviously can't be the argument today. Today, the shuttle is used to uh, you know, ferry seven people up into low Earth orbit, uh, launch a communication satellite that could just as well have been launched by an uh, unmanned so-called um, booster, and then the tomato plants didn't grow, or the newts are doing very well, thank you. And then they come back down again. And then that's called exploration. That's not exploration. 250 miles is, I don't know, uh, certainly more than the distance from, from Toronto to the Maritime Provinces. If you drove a bus back and forth uh, 20 times, would you call that exploration? Um, it, what NASA should be doing with the human program in terms of uh, public garnering public support and preparing for the future is going to other worlds, true exploration. And there the argument is, um, there are many that I try to draw forth in Pale Blue Dot, but one of them has to do with uh, safety, the safety of our species, uh, in the sense that in the long term, I'm not talking about years, I'm not talking about decades, but in the long term we, uh, we are a danger to ourselves, you actually to ourselves. You actually say that it's a choice between spaceflight and extinction. This is a, a huge and overpowering argument. But you also, I mean, in a, there's no, no conversation this brief can do justice to the subtleties of the book. But, but there are, as, as humanity chooses options here, and it is a case of a finite number of dollars, even if it's hundreds of billions, can't we clean up our act here and, 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 and make it through? without having to flee to other worlds? Well, <clears throat> we are a danger to ourselves. It's, there's no doubt about that um, because our technology has reached formidable, maybe even awesome proportions, and at the same time we live uh, and depend upon a very fragile environment. The thickness of the Earth's atmosphere compared to the size of the Earth is about the same as that of the coat of shellac on a big schoolroom globe mm. compared to the size of the globe. And here we are pouring all sorts of things into the atmosphere, some of which we now know are extremely dangerous, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons to deplete the ozone layer, and some of which we probably haven't been smart enough to figure out yet. And uh, it's just that in the long term we may make a serious mistake. I don't by any means think it's inevitable, and uh, I think we ought to devote to, uh, the most heroic efforts to making sure we preserve this beautiful planet. But at the same time, it's wise to hedge your bets, to, uh, as conservatives say, uh, diversify our portfolio. And uh, having self-sustaining human communities on other worlds in the long term seems to me uh, wise and prudent. Now, on the question of cost, if we bear in mind that we're talking about a very long time scale, and if we also bear in mind that the joint space programs of the spacefaring nations are extremely powerful, if we were to have coordinated... If we could pool the resources. Yeah. If we could pool the resources, both fiscal and intellectual, uh, then you, you just do the numbers and you see that it's perfectly possible to do without even increasing budgets. Do you understand why you're having so apparently such difficulty or an anticipating difficulty with the religious right or religious fundamentalism? I, mean, I, I don't. I don't. I have no difficulty with them. Uh, at least uh, I have heard absolutely nothing. You, you, you mean some of the discussion in the early part of Pale Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I haven't heard a thing. 
They're not not offended by the idea that we have looked at the creator of the universe and isn't it a coincidence he looks just like me? Uh, I do say something like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah in, I paraphrase, in, but, <laughs> but it's close. In in the con- it is in the context of uh, of the prevailing human conceit that we are not just at the center of the universe physically and metaphorically but that we are the point of the universe the reason there is a universe and if you think of the scale that I tried to describe at the yeah. very beginning of the program uh, all those stars and galaxies the idea that we are the center and the point of the universe is pathetic it's so obviously a conceit and uh, maybe was sustainable a few thousand years ago because, after all, the stars do seem to rise and set around yeah. us. I mean, that is the, the sort of straightforward explanation of naked eye astronomy. But uh, we now know much more than, than that. Many religions are perfectly happy with the findings of modern of modern science and um, even uh, well, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be possible? I think there was a, somebody wrote in the New York Times that the, the, the people of a religious conviction could take. The, the revelations and reminders of revelations in, in your book and reinforce their own beliefs. I mean, it, it makes, if there is a creator, the creator is much more awesome than even than our, than our minds had dared to presume That's a few just, years ago. That's just what I argue in, in Peluda, that, that if the universe is more magnificent, glorious, intricate, subtle, beautiful than we had thought, and if you want to believe in a creator, does this not make the creator more magnificent, subtle, elegant, and so on? What's, what's the problem? Why is there a problem? The problem is, if you uh, believe that a book written 2,500 years ago is the end-all and be-all of our knowledge, uh, then what's in that book is in contradiction with the clearest findings of modern science, and then you're in trouble. But if you don't believe that it is, it is religion's job to uh, make uh, authoritative pronouncements on the way the universe is, then your religion is is enhanced by the findings of science. Of science. What's on Titan? <coughs> <coughs> Titan is an extremely uh, interesting place. Uh, um, organic matter, the stuff of life, yeah. is falling from the skies of Titan like manna from heaven. There's so much of it that we can't see through to the surface of Titan. It's It's Socked in, <clears throat> and recently, um, um, Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based radar data have begun to fill in our information on the nature of the surface. But a key question is still unresolved: whether there are oceans of liquid hydrocarbons on the surface, uh, and we don't yet know the answer to that. But isn't it astonishing? If you want to know something about the chemistry of the origin of life go to the big moon of Saturn? Who would have figured that that's where we can learn about our own origins? And yet, that's the way it now looks. But that's, that's next door in terms of, in, in universal terms. Oh, ab- Titan's ab- just ab- down the street. From uh, here. Uh, absolutely, although it's... And you're uh, that close, and there's the other possibility of origins of life. Oh, no, no, no question. So then multiply that by all those hundreds of billions of other planets, and uh, you have some hint of what else may be possible. No diamonds on Mars, though, eh? Well, there has been a serious... uh, (laughs) You know, you've read this book very carefully, I must say. Uh, There has been a suggestion in the scientific literature that uh, there may be lots of diamonds on Mars, but it is a mere suggestion, and I would not think it would justify a program of exploration of Mars by itself. Uh, There are plenty of other We should have, we should explore Mars. Absolutely, a world of wonders. And uh, speaking about the the origin of life, despite the fact that Mars is uh, arid and frozen and desolate today, as far as we know, four billion years ago, it was warm and wet. There were rivers, there were lakes, there may even have been oceans. Now, four billion years ago is a very important time for our planet. That's the time of the origin of life. And so, isn't it possible that on the next door planet when conditions were very similar to what they were here life arose there also and if so is that life still hanging on in refugia uh, oases somewhere on Mars or is it extinct and awaiting uh, the search for chemical and morphological fossils 
the possibilities are extremely exciting uh, about Mars as well. What do I look like from Mars? A parasite? Uh, you are part of an extremely thin film of life that but, but covers do you, the do, surface. Do your resolution to within one meter act with the... With the, with the, with okay, the, with well... The, we well, see that the Earth is a pale blue dot, and I'm a parasite and my car is the dominant <laughs> creature. <laughs> From Mars, um, even with a large telescope, uh, you see continents and oceans and clouds, maybe mountains and rivers. You certainly do not see if we were to improve our resolution, our ability to see fine detail, um, it is only when we get uh, to uh, 100 meter and better resolution that even the artifacts of our civilization become apparent. Even the sky dome? Uh, yes. And it's not just a question of being able to resolve it, but does it have contrast with its surroundings? Because if the contrast yeah. is poor, you can't see it anyway. And what, what I'm describing is the result of... Uh, satellite and space probe uh, investigations of the Earth. Yeah, there was one you'd had them turn around and take a l quick little snapshot. Yeah, I'll, come, I'll, I'll, come to that. I'll come to that. A <laughs> little click and then off it goes forever. But humans, to, to see humans, you would have to be down to better than a, a meter resolution, which is, uh, we don't have many pictures of that sort. We are not, and even our artifacts are not very detectable. The title of the book, Pale Blue Dot, comes from the fact that the Voyager spacecraft whipped through the solar system, opened up the Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune systems for us, and are now on their way to the stars after they passed Neptune. Uh, it was, it seemed to me, such a good idea to turn the cameras of one of the spacecraft back and take a look at the planet that launched it. And we were able to do that, and there was the Earth, a pale blue dot, and it seemed so exquisite exquisitely beautiful, vulnerable, fragile, that um, to me it, it cried out to us to, to care for one another better and to care for this planet, which after all is the only home we've ever had. It spoke to me in a very spiritual way. What about all those asteroids that are whizzing around? And I, I'm, I'm not a betting man, but if I'm going to stick around for a couple of million years, one of those things is going to bop me, isn't oh, it? Oh, you're absolutely right. Bob. Bopping is in the cards. The Earth lives in a bad neighborhood, um, and uh, we orbit the sun ad amidst a uh, horde, a crowd of uh, asteroids and comets, and every now and then the Earth runs into one of them, or one of them runs into the Earth, and uh, the little ones cause little damage, the big ones cause big damage. Sixty-five million years ago, a big one hit the Earth, and is the, the presumptive, almost certain, cause for the extinction of the dinosaurs. Yeah, you're absolutely convinced of that. I well, think the evidence is now very clear, yeah. not just the dinosaurs, but 75% of the other species of life on Earth. And uh, that is as clear a reminder as, you, as we need, yeah. that we have to pay attention. And a much smaller uh, asteroid than, than the one that knocked off the dinosaurs can destroy our vulnerable global civilization. So we have to at least inventory these objects. Let's see if any of them is going to hit us in the comparatively near future. We're not even doing that. You picked up anything from on the, the intergalactic radio network lately? You are involved in a project that tries to receive radio signals from across. Yes, that's right. Is there so any, are you hearing anything? Not, not uh, intergalactic, but interstellar. Interstellar, stars, sorry. Stars, stars uh, in our own galaxy are there, surrounding any of those stars, a planet on which an advanced civilization with radio technology is broadcasting to us? That's, that's the question. And uh, while we have found some enigmatic um, findings, none of them repeats. And uh, repeatability is absolutely central to believability in science. But it may, is, that, is that possibly a failure of our brain, do you think, a shortcoming of no, your I intelligence just, just and mine? That I need repetition to convince me that... No, 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 clear. I think this is a, a realization of human fallibility. We are, uh, we are very uh, able to uh, deceive ourselves on matters of great import, and therefore uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, a commonplace claim, non-controversial, uh, your the the level of evidence needed is not as impressive. 
So we found um, events uh, that match all of our criteria for extraterrestrial intelligence. They're not on the Earth. They're strong. They're narrow band. They, a lot of characteristics, but not a one of them repeats. Not not uh, five minutes later. Not five years later. And that being the case, we cannot claim to have found it. And other search programs have, have uh, found similar enigmatic signals. But we are just at the earliest stages of the of the search. The technology is getting better and cheaper, and we're going to have a very serious search for extraterrestrial intelligence in the next few decades. Thank you so much. Carl Sagan is the author most recently of Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space. It's published by Random House. I'm Peter Zosky. You're listening to Morningside on CBC Radio. on a very insignificant world among many, which circles a humdrum star of the sun, which is one of 400 billion others that make up the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of 100 billion other galaxies that makes up the universe, which it is now beginning to look is one of uh, an enormous number, perhaps an infinite number of other closed off universes. In that context, of course we're tiny. Do, you, do, you, do those numbers still have meaning for you? Do you oh, actually sure. know what 100 billion well, means? Well, I can't picture it in my head, but I have difficulty picturing in my head six. I mean, six objects all at once. Close your eyes, see if you can see them all without sort of moving your, your mental eyes from one to another. But uh, what does it mean to, to know what 100? He, uh, he would uh, have people climb on his shoulders, one, one at a time, uh, and he would wade across the river... Uh, uh, in a shallow part and deposit them on the opposite bank, and that was his his occupation. Did he did he live long enough to understand the worlds that you were exploring in your work? No, he did not quite live to Sputnik. But there was one uh, one moment when I was age thirteen, and uh, he asked me uh, what it is I wanted to do when I grew up, and I said an astronomer. And uh, he didn't know what that meant. It had to be explained to him. And after he understood, he said, yes, yes, very impatiently, but how will you make a living? Um, <laughs> and uh, that was, in fact, a very deep question. I had never heard billion. It's uh, just to be able to calculate it, to know how that it's bigger than something and smaller than something. And um, Scientists do that all the time. So do uh, economists. So do people in balancing their pocketbook budgets. I, I don't think it's all that hard. Your book is a dramatic reminder of how dr of how human travel has accelerated in the last few decades, but you start with your family's own progress. Tell me a bit about your grandfather ferrying people across the, the, the river in Central Europe. My uh, mother's father, Leib Gruber, uh, grew up in a very poor family in uh, what was then the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the only job he could get was uh, being a beast of bird. Thought about it as uh, a way to make a living. I just thought of it as a way to to fulfill a uh, a joy. And I thought I'd have to have some quite other and very boring job in order to support myself and do astronomy weekends and uh, 
evenings, and it was one of the greatest moments of my life when my high school biology teacher told me there were people who were actually paid to do astronomy. If you could get him on the phone now and, and talk about, I mean, he lived through the age when we've gone from one satellite to exploration of the solar system, and, and, and you just had a moment or two to give him the news. What would it be? What's the most I significant guess I would thing say, we've uh, learned? Grandpa, we've, uh, we've explored almost... Carl Sagan is possibly the best-known scientist in the world. He has performed groundbreaking work about the nature of other planets. He's won a Pulitzer Prize for his book about the origins of human intelligence. His books and TV series have educated millions and millions of people about the universe. Carl Sagan's latest book is called Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space. He joins me now in our studio to talk about humanity's place in the universe. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I feel very small <laughs> when I read well, your book. I feel tiny. Well, you are, and so am I, and uh, so are the rest of us. I mean, uh, uh, being big isn't the only uh, the only thing. We we are. Well, we we live 